Not much scared Lance Armstrong, but this bike did. A revolutionary bike that was used by his arch nemesis Jan Ulrich to nearly defeat him in 2003. But how fast is it and how does it compare to a modern aero road bike? So far we've tested Stephen Rocha's Batalin, Le Mans Bilato and iconic Lotus 110. But after the UCI banned that and everything else, what comes next in the pantheon of legendary time trial bikes? Well, this, a bike so forward thinking that elements of it are still being copied today, like, well, it's got a proprietary bottom bracket. Yay! To be fair though, if you could have afforded to spend 10,000 euros on a frame set 20 years ago, you could definitely have afforded a special bottom bracket. But what you wanted to know, and what we still want to know, is just how fast is it? Should you find out? Yeah. Jesus, this is quick. Sounds like a rocket ship. Meow. Now, despite the giant logo on the down tube, it is this... pretty big, isn't it? No, 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 no. It's not the fact that it's a giant logo. It's not actually a giant. That's no. So it's actually a Valsa, see, or Walser, or because it was made by a chap called Andy Valsa from Switzerland, who was actually an architect who turned into a master carbon fibre craftsman. And he first made a bike for Jan Ulrich in 2003 and then continued to make them for the rest of his career. This one, as you may have guessed from the livery, is from his T-Mobile days. That's right. Now, to find out just how fast that bike is and how it stacks up next to a modern cutting-edge aero road bike, we've returned to GCN's Theatre of Dreams on the edge of the Cotswold. Now, if you're not familiar with this part of England, it's a wild and untamed wilderness, scoured by frigid winds and battered by brutal rainfall. Frankly, not much can survive up here. It's a serious test for presenters and bikes. Nothing is harder than the world famous B4040 from Acton Turville to Luckington and back all 8.53 kilometres of it. Yes. Now, first up, I'm going to go set a benchmark time on my Canyon Air Road before we then climb aboard Jan Ulrich's Valsa. And while Sai's out setting his benchmark time, I'm going to tell you everything that makes this bike special and why Lance was scared of it. Was it bugged by US anti-doping? Was it once owned by Dick Pound? Who's Dick Pound? He was the boss of WADA. He didn't like Lance. He was out to get Lance. Dick Pound didn't own this bike. Go on, do you run. I'll go get Take my shoes on. book with you. <laughs> you know, the sound of one man bleeping to himself is a bit sad, isn't it? But um, anyway, here we go. Beep, 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 beep. While Sai is out on course, let's take a closer look at this amazing bike. More specifically, the frame, which is a custom carbon layer that was built by Walser, a Swiss company, or more specifically, Andy Walser. This bike was absolutely cutting edge in its day, and the standout feature of it, aside from its beautiful aero sleek lines, is its width. See, the rear uh, hub spacing on this bike is just 110 millimeters. That is 20 millimeters narrower than what you get on a standard road bike or time trial bike hub spacing. The bottom bracket is just 50 millimeters wide. So it's got a much narrower Q factor as well than what you find on standard road bikes. And this means it can only take custom cranks and custom rear wheels in order to make it work. The importance of making a bike narrow is something that's come a bit back in vogue, as recently you may remember Filippo Ganna's Our Record bike had an emphasis on this too, although admittedly he only had one gear at the back because it was a track bike. He had an 89 millimetre uh, dropout spacing on the rear and a narrower bottom bracket as well. The thinking is that by having the bike narrower, you reduce the frontal area and make it more aerodynamic. 
but this does create problems. So, as I said, you need custom wheels and custom cranks. The original wheels, which were uh, branded up as Pro that had been custom made for this bike, actually went AWOL, but the owner, Dan, has made these replacement ones to go in it that look very similar. Actually, if you look closely, you can see they're Zip 808s because they've got the dimples in them. But they've uh, he's beautifully created these uh, Pro and T-Mobile livery to go on them so that they really do look the part. Of course, Ulrich would have also used disc wheels uh, at, in certain time trials as well back in the day. But what you've actually got here is almost like a bodge to make this work. And this is the same as what Ulrich had. So it's running 10 speed Shimano Jura Ace, but he only has nine sprockets on the back and has a nine speed shifter uh, at the front. So it's a 10 speed chain, 10 speed chain rings, 10 speed rear mech, but he's only got the, uh, the nine sprockets available because one of them had to be filed down and removed so that you could take account for that uh, reduced spacing on the rear hub to make the wheel fit. So what can I tell you about this bike then, my Canyon Air Road, other than it's very rapid? Uh, well, new Dura Race is 12 speed of course and all sprockets are present and correct. What's interesting I think about this bike is that compared to a lot of other modern aero bikes it is strikingly narrow like the Valsa although both the bottom bracket and the hub spacing are completely standard but I have a feeling this is going to be quite a close run thing because although this isn't a TT bike my position on it can be quite aero. My handlebars are only 38 centimetres wide, so when fully tucked in, I feel like I'm pretty aero anyway. But then also, I think this frame may well be more aerodynamic, and similarly, the cockpit area as well. The profile of the handlebar is significantly more aero than the one on the Valsa. So yeah, I honestly, I still think this might edge it. Roaring tailwind out, stonking headwind back. But it's the same for everyone and every bike. <laughs> With run number one under my belt, I went and sought shelter in the Fox and Hounds and left Ollie and my bike to their own devices. Right, it's absolutely freezing. Um, I don't know where Sai's gone. I'm going to do my first run on the canyon, beat myself in. Beep, 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 and we're off. You've heard about the tech specs, but why did this bike scare Lance? Well, Jan Ulrich missed the 2002 Tour de France because he was banned for six months having taken amphetamines in a nightclub. But when he returned in 2003, he did so astride a very sleek, futuristic looking black time trial bike that was clearly not made by his team sponsor, Bianchi. It was a Valsa. Now, in 2003, Lance, if you remember, was going for his fifth Tour de France title and he was never more vulnerable than he was that year. Jan Ulrich crushed him in stage 12's epic time trial by 1 minute 30 to get within just 36 seconds of taking the yellow jersey. Now unfortunately, as you know from history, Ulrich never got closer than that and so Lance did indeed take his fifth Tour de France title, but this bike stayed with Lance to the point where he actually commissioned his bike sponsor Trek to copy the design. However, legend has it that Lance didn't get on with that narrow Q factor. He felt like it robbed him of power and gave him tendonitis. So it turns out that Lance and I do actually have something in common, a dislike of narrow Q factors. I suspect the similarities end there. Now owing to the very different weather conditions, it's pretty much impossible to compare times we do on the course to those we've done in previous videos. Today it's very slow, it's cold 
It's rainy, it's windy as anything. So I'm not looking forward to the return because I've got a honking tailwind. I'm not gonna lie, I feel as cool as a cucumber sat astride this bike. I take it I look as cool as a cucumber. This is so cool. Right. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah. It makes the most incredible noise. Sounds like a rocket ship. Yeah. I tell you what, compared to the three time trial bikes I've ridden before it, this feels like a proper bike. There is nothing vintage about it, which is just as well, because in these conditions, I don't fancy riding something that doesn't really resemble the bikes that I'm used to. Maybe it's because I'm getting old, but this is, this is my era of Durace, this one. I remember being given it I'm going to ride at 70 RPM, just like Jan. Oh, wow. Might be in the epicenter of Storm Brenda or whoever's rolling in today, but that was so good like I don't care whether this bike was released in 2002 or 2022 that is mint such a good bike no wonder Lance wanted one we get to ride some proper cool bikes here at GC I know and this wow I'm really excited to ride it. It's, uh, this position's pretty extreme though. All right, let's see how we get on. Beep, 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 beep. Oh, we're up. Jesus, this is quick. This is rapid. So this bike definitely comes from the school of thought that lower at the front end is better. Jan Ulrich's riding position is pretty extreme by modern standards. When you look at his saddle to bar drop, I'm struggling. There's no doubt in my mind that if I tried to do a max power test, I wouldn't do as much power on this compared to my own TT bike because the position doesn't suit me but but that isn't the aim of the game here I have to do much less power we've got Wahoo power pedals on here so I can match whatever I do with that on the canyon the same power again it's that thing the level of perceived exertion far higher the longer cranks the aggressive position oh my god the quads are on fire in a way that they don't feel on modern bikes I feel like I need an umbrella like I'm some kind of pit crew here he is, Jan Bridgewood, or Ollie Ulrich, or ah, Ollie Jan Ulrich Bridgewood. Oh, it's so grim. It is, it's like something out of Ice Road Truckers, isn't it? Oh, tell me about it. But more importantly, 
let's not talk about the weather, despite being British. <laughs> How was it? This thing is rapid. Like, absolutely, like on that, we've got a sunken tailwind today. Going out, like, six, I was hitting 60k an hour. Yeah. Like, unbelievable. But it feels like, to me, like, it sounds really stupid, but it's a proper bike, isn't it? Like, I don't know if it's because I'm getting old, but that feels like a proper bike to me. Maybe like 20 years is the it's, magic it's, number. This is your era, this bike. Well, it is my era, yeah. <laughs> I d maybe if a young whippersnapper got on that bike, they'd be like, whoa, what's this? This is rubbish. But for me, that just feels yes, awesome. Like, it's not, comp it doesn't feel compromised. Like, no. it, it, it's stiff. It's pretty light, it's aero, the gears are good. Yeah. Like they all work, like. And the, the handling is just on point as well. Oh yeah. Valsa knew what he was doing, architect that he was. Yeah, I mean, a few things though. Like I said, when I was riding it, the position's so aggressive. When I felt like I was fusing the vertebrae in my neck. Like, thank God this is only like eight and a half K. If this was like long, I'd be in trouble. Like it's, too, it's far too aggressive for me. And yeah. the, the cranks being longer as well, like. My quads are on fire. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting, okay, because results-wise, so so I didn't ride on power. I rode on perceived effort, and I went full gas on both of them because that's what I tend to do. And actually, in terms of time, it was identical on my air road to the Valsa. Totally identical to the second. Right. Which is pretty weird, isn't it? But again, just perceived effort. Okay, well, if the perceived efforts, yeah, the same, I can believe that because, so I did ride on power um, and the difference is huge. Is like, it? Just in eight on, and a half Which way? K, which way? This is way quicker. Like way quicker. That dog is surprised as well. But like you'll see, like when you look at the, my position riding it, like it's way more power. It's not sustainable, but it's way lower and more aero. So for the same power output, which was sort of 265, 270 normalized. Um, I was like 34 seconds quicker on this than that in just eight and a half kilometers. Wow! Like monstrous. But in, in terms of what you were saying about riding on perceived effort and it being the same, I, I can believe that because although my power was the same on both bikes, the perceived effort on this was way more. This felt so much harder. Like I, I was comfortable on that. This I was in pain. Like. <laughs> <laughs> right, two questions then. Firstly, Position's way more air on that, even if it's not more sustainable. But what about the bike? Do you think the bike is more aero with that narrow Q factor? And which actually I didn't even notice, weirdly. Yeah. Uh, and also then the uh, the narrower dropouts. I, I mean, that would be a nice thing to know. I think it's it, there's not. I don't think there's a huge amount in it. No. And that, I, it's funny you should mention the Q factor. It didn't. I didn't notice it. No, I totally forgot. I didn't notice the Q factor. Well, actually, to be fair, those uh, Wahoo Speedplay pedals, the blue pedals, wider. have got a slightly wider Q factor. Maybe it compensated. It compensated. Um, all right. Second question then. What do you reckon is more aero, that Lotus 110, or that? I think the. I want to ride that Lotus again. I think that. I think the Valsa is more aero. Like it's just little things like the, the bars and stuff. That Lotus was a dog's dinner. The comment section gonna eat you alive for saying that. No, no, but, but it's true, to, it's we, true. We need, we need to justify that statement. Uh, there was a confusion, I think, about the Lotus in the Lotus video in the comments, because a lot of people d don't realize that it, that it is a bit of a dog's dinner, that 110. Steve Grimwood would attest to this, because it's not the definitive Lotus. It's the 108, the track bike is the Lotus. And yeah. the 110, is is kind of a compro a road compromise and consequently it's quite messy in places it's basically all about the aesthetics the 110 yeah isn't it? it's so, to make it look like a lotus but actually it's got none of the good lotusy bits apart from the fact that the down tube's gone missing well i think what what i want to do is I'll, we'll put a call if anyone's got a lotus 108 track bike that they're willing to let us ride in some capacity please reach out to us we won't bring it to the cotswolds because as you can see <laughs> it's a savage and utterly grim place and it's not somewhere you want to put a 108 through its paces um right we've got to say a huge thank you to dan from vintage velos for lending us this incredible piece of history he's got a youtube channel vintage velos so make sure you head over there give it a subscribe because he makes videos about the cool bikes that he's got in his collection of which this is just one so uh so yeah thank you dan especially because it's raining and you've let us use your priceless heirloom yeah right can we get can we get inside and get a, the hot drink
Yeah. <laughs> so, it's on days like today where yeah. I kind of think that maybe it'd be nice to make videos indoors. Yeah, give us, give us a thumbs up. Bye. <laughs> Ooh, got wet, Sammy.